Welcome to the Legion Strength and Conditioning Podcast. You can check us out at legionsc.com or follow us on Instagram at legion.sc. So with people getting back into the gym after a decent amount of time out of the gym, uh, there's a lot of things to consider, right? Folks are excited, sort of chomping at the bit, ready to go, wanting to do thrusters and pull-ups again after just doing lunges and push-ups for a while. And most people have some sort of understanding that they need to be a little bit cautious with just throwing themselves back into full volume, full intensity training. But there's a little, you know, demon on their shoulder kind of whispering in their ear, like, just go for it, max out, do a bunch of pull-ups. It's going to be awesome. And we want to just give folks some ideas of how to think about getting back into high volume, high intensity training or higher volume, higher intensity training in a gym environment after spending some time training at home or in a garage or with, you know, a set of mismatched dumbbells and a resistance band. So Luke, what do we want to think about going from one type of training into, you know, back into full tilt, CrossFit, all the stuff that we love to do? Uh, Well, I think, I think the logical way of going about this is to work backwards and to sort of see the where you were before you sort of took this break or this transition period of, of training and if you're trying to get back to that point um try and think about the things that you haven't done in that time try and think about the certain qualities that you haven't trained and then it's about trying to build yourself back up to that stage so if you want to sort of like look at this as where you were before was zero where you currently are is say for instance minus two you are going to need to go through a phase of training to get you back up to zero. Uh, and I think that the people are probably fairly aware of that. Um, but if you say, for instance, look at sports teams and how they would start to uh, organize their training during preseason, it's very much probably going to be focused around doing basic drills, things that they have done for a long time, and then getting back into more sort of sport specific practice eventually. Um, the way I like to think about it is when I used to play rugby as a kid, we would play touch rugby um, or tag rugby for a couple of weeks before going into contact. Um, part of that was the floor was uh, solid as a rock, so it wasn't really safe to actually go into full contact, but we needed to develop some level of fitness before we then started to practice game scenarios. And the same is applicable to competing in fitness. You know, you're going to have to build volume to get yourself back to the previous training uh, phase that you were in. So you, you're not looking at the competition that you are look, wanting to do in six months and you're not looking to prepare for that. What you're looking to do is spend a period of time getting back into training, getting back so that you can then have a starting point towards preparing for that competition uh, or preparing for the open or whatever it may be. I think a lot of this is kind of equatable to early CrossFit days um, when there was a few, a few cases of people getting rhabdo from training. And for the most part, it was just people not understanding that they can't just jump in and do Murph without any previous experience. You know, that kind of high volume of work after a period of inactivity is just not, it's not good in any way. Like it's going to be more harmful to try and do too much than to literally sit down and do nothing. Yeah, that the the idea of functional volume is something that we've talked about before. And essentially, um, you know, that that a, a good way to think about it is sort of something that, that endurance athletes have thought about in the past is, you know, how much can you increase your mileage per week without increasing your risk of injury? And there's some different ways of calculating that. There's sort of a general rule of thumb of increasing your weekly mileage by no more than 10%. And then there's some more advanced ways of potentially calculating how much you can change your weekly mileage. And there's, you know, more more variables that can go into it because, work at a certain intensity may have more overall fatiguing properties than work at other intensities. And the, the, the point isn't to necessarily develop a perfect model of how much mileage you can do in a week, but just to sort of have a rule of thumb so you don't do something really stupid, right? And getting back into doing movements that you haven't done 
uh, a similar a similar mindset is potentially helpful, right? Because even if you have been training, even if you have been doing a lot of push-ups and lunges and dumbbell snatches, that doesn't mean that your tissues are adapted to doing high volume kipping pull-ups or toes to bar or GHD sit-ups or any of those other movements that, you know, people like you mentioned, John, are, uh, um, are capable of giving people rhabdo based upon the, the high eccentric demands of those movements, meaning that the lowering phase of that movement, like as you lower yourself from the top of a pull-up to a dead hang, as you sit back on a GHD sit-up, as you lower yourself from standing into a lunge, that that's the eccentric phase of that movement. And the eccentric phase of movements is when the most actual damage occurs to muscles. So movements that have um, certain types of eccentric phases to them are much more prone to making people sore and much more prone to actually causing like tissue damage that becomes problematic at the level of rhabdo. So if you haven't been doing certain movements, you've lost the adaptation to the eccentric phase of that movement. So you're going to be at risk for causing problems for yourself going from zero pull-ups to 75 pull-ups to 100 pull-ups to 150 pull-ups, whatever you're going to try to do, right? Um, and it, it doesn't mean that if you've been doing dumbbell rows that you are adapted to high volume kipping pull-ups. So I think that's something that's really important to, to be aware of. Yeah, like I think that you, yeah, the, the sort of a lot of people will associate certain movements and patterns to the things that they're going to be doing in their sport, but in in reality, it's like okay, they may be similar, it might be the same movement pattern, but there is a completely different type of stress. Um, this the 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 sort of this demanded when you're going through <clears throat> high eccentric. Um, typical metcons and things like that so it could be useful to if you are looking for something to create some intensity to be looking at like low eccentric based movements and and uh, and, and and practices so things like sled work um looking at using the the bike the rower the skier that type of stuff um i think it's i think one way of looking about it as well is that you can be really really focused and have this sort of perfect plan where you know you you're increasing volume over time and all this type of thing. I think that maybe some variation in the training, having um, a little bit of adaptability and a little bit of flexibility with your training could be useful. And the way I sort of see it is, is maybe, you know, going back to uh, some, some of the sort of old school competitor style training back, you know, maybe um, five, seven years ago where it was, okay, you do two strength pieces and then you hit a Metcon, something like that. It could be about doing something like that for a couple of weeks where it's not going to be placing too much stress on the body, stuff that you're um, not used to, but it's, it's building in those movement patterns gradually. And then it's also, is getting people in the right frame of mind for training where they can sort of start off um, and they can enjoy it a little bit. Because I think that most people are going to get back into the gym and they're going to probably feel the need to... Um, they, they 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 might might feel restless and they might want to do lots of different things and following a really really structured and rigid plan to start off with might not be the best way to go about it because they might get to a couple of weeks in and be like oh fuck it i'm just gonna <laughs> i'm gonna do i'm gonna do fran grace helen back to back and <laughs> just see what happens or you know there's there's probably like an element of uh just frustration around going back into the gym, having access to all of this different equipment that you haven't had access to for a long time and going back to, you know, very, very strict, rigid progressions um, for a long time. But obviously that depends on how you sort of, you know, how, how training is for you uh, and what sort of, uh, what you get out of it psychologically. I think as much as we talk there about the volume, I think the the loading and the the stress on the body that way is important to to keep track of because you know again most people uh don't have access to the kind of equipment that is going to allow them to do focused strength work um some of them will some of the some people have barbells they have enough weight on dumbbells or kettlebells where they're going to be able to maintain strength potentially even improve their strength but you know for the other 80 percent of people they're not gonna be able to lift the way they have been lifting and it's important to know when you get back into the gym that you can't expect your percentage of work to, to feel the same. You can't expect your max to be the same. So if you come in and day one, you're like, okay, I'm going to back squat. I haven't squatted heavy in a long time. 
you can't come in and hit you know sets of five at 75 80 percent and expect it to move well like it's it's going to be tough in the gym it's going to be a lot tougher when you you know the day after or two days later as that catches up to you you have to have an expectation that your max strength is going to be lower and again for some people that isn't going to be the case they have the equipment to keep working on their strength but um, a lot of people don't have that option john if you if you have someone who you know has been training but without doing actual strength work right say they have a moderately heavy dumbbell and have been doing a lot of body weight stuff and they're coming back in and they're looking to back squat or snatch or clean and jerk or whatever after weeks and weeks and weeks off from doing those movements, what can they expect in terms of what they can lift? Are they going to be, you know, at 50% of their max? Are they going to be at 80% of their max? What do you think is a, a good framework? And obviously it varies depending on the individual, but yeah. what, what, what do you think is like a good outline for someone? Well, I think, I think there's ways to mitigate that loss. Um, which will determine how much how much you drop off there. So for some people who are maybe don't have the best squat technique, maybe they're a little imbalanced left and right through their hips, through their ankles, whatever. Um, if they spend this time working on their positioning, on their on their balance, on their movement patterns, um, they might be able to come back in and you know their old one rep max may now be, or their new max may be 90% of their old max. You know, if they've if they've actually improved their movement without working on strength, um, or if they've been doing a lot of single leg work and they're a little more balanced now, maybe they can keep it up that high. For most people, I would say a previous max is gonna be, if there was a test out day one back in the gym, it's probably more like 80 to 85% of their previous max. Um, you know, that's that's kind of expected day one. Not to say I wouldn't come back quickly, but. Yeah, like we've talked about on past podcasts that you're going to potentially lose your quote unquote edge in a lot of ways, but that doesn't mean you've lost the overall adaptation. So like you said, a lot of that stuff can and will come back relatively quickly after a few weeks of just training again. Um, but also to, to your point, right? I mean, it's not like you need to come back in and just test your max again right away. It's not right. like, okay, I was in the middle of this squat cycle and I was at this many reps at 85%. And I'm just going to pick it up again. It's like, you don't need to do that. Yeah. Right? It, it, it's, it's potentially relevant to just say, you know what, I'm just going to do a few sets at 60% of my previous max today without any specific plan or attachment to how it feels or whatever. I'm just like greasing the groove on doing this movement pattern again. And I'm hoping to rebuild over the course of several weeks in order to get back to where I was. And I don't even care what my numbers actually are until I've been doing this for four weeks. Yeah. For our, for our class program at my gym, um, we just, we'd, we'd finished week one of our new training cycle before we closed um, so we are going to restart that, that cycle when we reopen. Um, but I think the plan is to do at least a week per, per month of the gym being closed as like a reintroduction. So if the gym is, ends up being closed for two months, well, we're probably going to take the first two weeks back as not necessarily strict percentage work or a, a focused training cycle, but more of just working on movements again, letting people build back up in weights and intensity a little bit before we kick back into a normal training cycle. Yeah, I think that maybe some form of like linear progression in some sense, but like really lowballing it and starting off with something that's very manageable and doing that for a period of time could be quite useful before getting into it. I think just sort of maybe getting back into old habits and routines of, all right, okay, I did this last week and I'm going to do a little bit more this week and um, yeah, I think that this period of time is, you know, everyone is uh, one squat cycle away from um, achieving all of their dreams, right? And it, I think that a lot of people have a bit of a focus of like, on Monday is going to be the start of this new thing. And it's going to be the, that's going to be the new chapter. And where, you know, the, um, I think an, an, an analogy that uh, it was not an analogy, um, but John Wellborn from Power Athlete said something along the lines of, if you back squat twice uh, heavy every single week, you're going to be strong. And it's sort of like having a little bit of that type of view of training uh, and just sort of bringing it back to basics and being like, okay, I'm going to um, go heavy once per week and I'm going to see how it feels and I'm going to add a little bit onto that. 
um, and and not necessarily be like I said before, not being stuck to a rigid structure and program and having the ability to change it up um, do something that's going to probably have a little bit more of enjoyment, but obviously sticking to these rules of thumb of, okay, I'm not going to be increasing by too much week per week with the volume and the intensity, being smart about it. Um, but as well as that, you know, not, um, not necessarily being super rigid there as well. Uh what do you guys think about uh, conditioning intensity, right? I mean, we talked about that in the past as well, where one of the things that people are going to potentially lose from having taken time off of actual training in the gym is that ability to tolerate like really fast, high power output training, right? So meaning something that's a short, a short workout with assault bike calories and moderate weight power cleans, right? 21, 15, nine of that, something just, just brutal where, you know, you can sort of imagine the, uh, the metallic taste in your mouth and that kind of like wheezing cough that comes after doing something like that. Um, not to, uh, uh, you know, too soon to be talking about wheezing coughs, I suppose. But, um, <laughs> what, what do you guys think in terms of the, the ability to get back into doing something like that? And what should people expect if they do try to do something that's pretty hard and nasty like that. Uh, I don't think it's going to be smart to go back into the usual types of movements that you would do. So it's not necessarily about hitting chest of bar pull-ups as soon as you get back into it, maybe go back to a, a regular kipping pull-up um, and then trying to make sure that you build on that. So one thing that I've sort of done when people are getting back into some form of training um, and they've not necessarily been, they've, they've gone on holiday or they've come back from injury or something like that is using basic body weight gymnastics type movements, um, you know, getting into conditioning pieces progressively, building the intensity through weight, building the intensity through paces. Uh, but I think a lot of rate of perceived effort work is probably going to be quite useful, um, because that way people can then make sure they're working at the correct intensity and they're not just trying to chase something that um that was there before so i think that also uh we've sort of spoken about this but doing one hard thing per week that is pretty hard and that's probably a good way to end the week so sort of like a throw down situation could be useful um so that you're actually you know you're, you're getting a bit of practice in that sport but at the same time understanding that you're not going to be able to do the same workouts that you were doing previously and bringing down the complexity of movements there bringing down the loading a little bit um, maybe doing things that are going to be less uh, loading you less structurally but then also using things like sandbags uh, doing sandbag carries and sled pushes and movements like that which will um punish you and which are really challenging uh, but at the same time they don't break down um, sort of tissue too much you know there, there's not too much eccentric movement going through that so that it's, it's not going to be um, destroying you for a week after what do you guys think about um, just detaching from results I mean I think that th those are some really good tips that you mentioned Luke in terms of like how to reintroduce intensity and actually I think that, that another potential benefit of some of those things is that it's not the same as having a score, like I said, on 21.15.9 Assault Bike Power Clean, where you're like, okay, this this is what I should be able to get on this. So you might not have that same feeling for like doing more sandbag carries or slide pushes or whatever. Um, but for a lot of folks, I mean, it's going to be tough to come back in and feel like, okay, even though I know my one rep max is going to be quote unquote less than it was before, even though I know I'm going to potentially have lost some of the the, the sharpness of my conditioning edge it's not going to feel good to potentially do badly on stuff that you in the past have been working on or had seen improvements on, or you see your assault bike pace is slower than you think it should be. How do, how do you guys encourage people to, to detach from those results and to, to handle that from a mental perspective? I've actually had a conversation in the past couple of days with two or three of my athletes um, on that subject. Um, and it's, it's not, uh, it's not on the results when they get back into the gym, it's their results currently. Um, but it's still applicable both ways that if it's not, you know, what numbers you're putting up isn't necessarily going to be important. It's the same kind of year round, you know, people get obsessed with, with performance numbers. Um, it's the, the downside to being in such a data driven kind of sport, but um, just because your numbers don't improve um, or just because your numbers decrease doesn't mean you haven't improved. Um, and you can take something like a, an assault bike power clean workout. And if you don't have a bike or a barbell at home for the 
six weeks, two months, you're not in the gym, then yeah, that's not going to be an improvement. But maybe you've improved in other ways. Maybe your your body weight cycle speeds have improved. Maybe your burpee technique is a little more efficient. You know, there's definitely things you can have improved. And it's important to understand that number improvement or result improvement isn't the only it's not like the single thing that defines your success. Um, and if you can improve in, in other areas that aren't immediately testable, that is okay. Um, and, you know, within two, three weeks of being back in the gym, you can expect to see improvement in those areas that you haven't been able to hit for a while. Yeah, I think the idea of improvement not always showing up tangibly in numbers right away is super, super important. Like you said, John, that you know, improving your overall aerobic capacity, which improves your ability to recover between sets of training or improving your movement quality doesn't necessarily mean that you get a faster time on a quote unquote CrossFit workout, right? Having all that stuff in place and then doing CrossFit for six weeks means that you might actually see an improvement in your CrossFit, in your CrossFit workout time. So that's something that can be hard for people to grasp. Um, but that's really important to, to recognize that improvements don't always immediately translate into improvements in scores. Um, but kind, kind of related to that, um, you know, so, something else I was thinking about is like, okay, you have all these people who have been training in a non-ideal scenario and then are jumping back into training into a gym and it's going to be uncomfortable and you're going to potentially feel bad about how you're performing, but that doesn't necessarily mean that like you shouldn't feel bad about how you're performing, right? Like it's not ideal and it's not necessarily helpful, but it's probably going to happen anyway, right? Like you, even though you listen to this podcast and you know all this stuff and you're like, okay, I'm going to not be as strong. I'm going to have a hard time doing the volume of kipping pull-ups that I used to be able to do. If I try to do something too fast and powerful, I'm just going to fall apart and totally bonk on it. And then you do it and you're like, I knew this was going to happen, but I'm still thinking that I'm screwed. I've lost all my fitness. Everyone else is better than me. Um, I'm never going to achieve my goals. What's wrong with my pro programming? Like it's all going to happen. And you can't necessarily expect that to not happen, but you can potentially understand how to not react to that, right? Because I think that the, the actual problem from that stuff doesn't necessarily come from that, you know, emotional uh, impulse to kind of like freak out a little bit right after something goes wrong. The real problem comes like from people feeding into that and kind of spinning their wheels and getting like agitated and then trying to do random stuff or like hopping from program to program or trying to add more in because they feel like they need to make up for lost time. Like that the the consequences that actually impact people aren't just that that negative emotional reaction. It's like the things that they start to do based upon that reaction. So like, is there a way for people to insert a space between kind of freaking out, which is probably going to happen independent of whether or not it makes sense, and then doing something that's unhelpful in terms of your actual training plan? I think uh, that that's definitely an issue that people have like all of the time with training. And I think that the one way... Um, I think some form of like reflection on training is going to be essential for that. Um, just because, you know, it could be just reminding yourself of the successes that you're having in training, you know, because I think it, what people tend to do is they tend to anchor themselves onto um, individual things that may have happened in training, which are negative. And then that leads to them, as you say, Todd, you know, spinning their wheels, getting agitated. Um, I think that now is like a really good time to actually practice um, just some more, uh, more of the sort of psychological things around training and some of the things that we have in terms of self-talk, um, trying to sort of stick with the plan long-term, you know, looking at things over a long-term period of time, you, you can get frustrated and it is going to happen. And I think we live in a world now where, um, it is really easy to get frustrated because you can get very, very distracted very, very quickly. Um, and you know, the sort of the, um, everything day to day is, is sort of almost set up for us to get distracted and, and for those uh, negative emotions to be able to start to then override. But I think that if you are able to go through this period of training and you can uh, be reserved through your expectations, be adaptable, be disciplined, and then try to also maybe create some new routines and habits around your training, um, which could be, you know, going through some form of reflection at the end of each session. Um, in your training log, writing down some of the things that you did well, um, writing down some of the areas that 
you could improve on, but trying to be very specific in that as well. Because what I, I tend to find is that like, um, you know, when people do start to get agitated about things in their training is um, you, there's sometimes, sometimes people tend to just hold on to one thing and it gets out of, um, it gets a bit out of hand and they can't actually really draw upon anything specific which they uh, they're trying to uh, present as being the issue, but what they end up doing is they end up just creating this narrative, uh, which sort of perpetuates perpetuates itself. They go on Instagram, they see the people that they sort of compete against in their, in their peer group, and they're like, okay, well, um, they're doing this, and I'm not doing this, and that gets out of hand. So I think that going through that, and then at the end of the week, looking over your training, reflecting on your training. Um, looking at the things that you were successful in, just going over that type of stuff again can reaffirm um, things. Because at the end of the day, like success in training isn't about the success that you're having today, right now. It's about being able to create adaptation long term and being able to adapt to training a little bit at a time. It's not about these huge jumps because if you go into training and all of a sudden you've got access to all of this equipment now and you start to hit it hard and guess what? You do a, a couple of good workouts and you feel like you're on a bit of a peak. You're probably going to have some down period after that. You're not going to be able to have that cons consistently. So if you can focus on making very, very small wins each session, which is like, okay, I did really well on these three set sets of snatches. I focused on the turnover and it felt a lot crisper. If you can focus on that type of stuff, that stuff eventually turns into big stuff, which eventually turns into actual performance improvement um, and the things that we see on leaderboards, on Instagram feeds and things like that. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's tough to come up with really specific tangible actions for people to do in that situation. I like the idea of, you know, keeping a training log and trying to to have some reflection in there. And, you know, for for athletes who I coach and who I work with, I, I want feedback from them in terms of how they're feeling or if they're feeling upset or um, frustrated with something, right? Because that's really good feedback in terms of being able to potentially actually target training at something that may need work or to just help them reframe expectations. Because a lot of times people are feeling frustrated or upset because like we talked about before, they, they don't understand the, the normal variation in training performance. They don't understand uh, how difficult it potentially is to actually improve certain things. They don't understand that they're improving in, in ways that aren't necessarily measurable, like you mentioned, John. Um, but that if someone is able to sort of bounce those ideas off of someone, that can be super, super helpful for them, especially for athletes who haven't, you know, had the experience of coaching dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of people uh, in a specific sport where when you have that experience, you can kind of see, hey, listen, like here's the normal range of experiences that people are going to have. And what you're experiencing right now is not out of the bounds of normal. Like you're actually doing okay. And I think that that's what a lot of people need is that reassurance that like, this is actually okay. This is a normal part of this process. And it happens to pretty much everyone. It happens to people who are cross the games qualifiers. It happens to people who are just class members. Like this is not abnormal and you're not like screwing up or on the wrong path or something like that. So I'm not sure what a, a good tangible way is for someone to get that experience if they're not necessarily working with a coach. But I think that that's, that's a really valuable aspect of of having someone who is coaching you who can just kind of like reframe your experience and kind of put it back into, um, you know, put it back into perspective. I don't know. Do you guys, th can you guys think of anything that's like a, a tangible thing that someone can do if they don't have a coach who they're working with? Yeah. So the, I, I do. Okay. So uh, one thing that I've encouraged people to do and I did myself, um, it was like doing a daily score. So I would assess like, you know, my biofeedback in certain areas and, what I found useful with that was it actually like called me out on my own bullshit because I would write down every single day how I was sleeping, how I was eating and all of these things. And then if training wasn't going the way I wanted it to, and then I looked over those daily scores and I was able to sort of see what was going on, it, it sort of centered me and it brought me back down to, you need to fix up this and this and this and this to have a, you know, a, a positive effect on your training overall. But I do think some level of like journaling so it could be, um, all right, I'm going to be doing, you know, um, a success, a challenge and something in between in training or, you know, some general comments. And then I think at the end of the week, you know, on your rest day, having some form of reflection to go over your training um, 
I think that that is a good way of just keeping people in check. Uh, like I said, it could, you, you know, the things that you write down um, when you're probably not pissed off with training or whatever it is, or you're not hyped up from training when you're a little bit more even keel, it can be good because it, you can then put things down in, in writing that's going to call you out on your own bullshit and make you sort of ref, reflect a little bit more and be a little bit more real. I think one thing that can be good for people when they do get back in the gym, um, treat it as if you've come back from an injury and your physical therapist or doctor has just told you that you have no restrictions in the gym. Like you can go into the gym and as long as nothing causes pain, you can do whatever you want. And then take the first week in that mindset of, okay, let's see how things feel. Let's do some 50% back squats, see how that feels. Let's do some 60% power clean, see how that feels. Let's do some assault bike sprints. And just kind of feel stuff out and see where your, how your body responds to different, different levels of loading and intensity before you before you jump back in you know if you've if you just recovered from a a knee injury or a a hip injury day one you're not trying to pr your power clean or your squat clean you know you're feeling it out you're doing some light reps you're seeing if you have any issues and treat that first week back in the gym just like that just kind of test it out no one's trying to win anything week one just kind of ease yourself back in yeah i think that's that's great, very tangible, actionable feedback for people. And to kind of summarize some of the recommendations, I think it's also important for people to think about the eccentric volume that they're that they're taking on, particularly with movements like pull-ups, toes to bar, GHD sit-ups, squatting, deadlifting, etc. And in terms of guidelines there, it's a little bit tricky because everyone is going to have a slightly different training setup that they've been doing. Um, some people have been able to do those movements in some capacity, right? Some people have been able to do strict pull-ups, but not kipping. Some people have been able to do some hinging movements, but maybe not heavy deadlifts. So it's going to be, it's going to be variable based upon that, but potentially a good way to think about it is just like keeping track of the total number of repetitions you're doing, right? Say you're, you're getting back into doing kipping toes to bar, like, okay, a good starting point might be somewhere between 30 and 45 repetitions per week. And then if you want to start adding volume to that, you know, assuming that that you are capable of doing those 30 to 45 reps without too much of a problem. Well, like maybe you can add 10 to 15 reps per week, right? So that's at least a, a way to think about it is just keep track of how many reps you've done and then add some based upon that, right? It gets a little bit more complicated with barbell movements because the actual load itself is going to be a little bit variable. Um, in terms of the actual intensity of workouts, I mean, John, like you mentioned for strength stuff, it's probably a good idea to start you know, 50, 60% of previous maxes, and there's no need to try to push that right away, that you're just trying to reacclimate to that movement. And in terms of intensity on conditioning pieces, you know, I think that it's going to be something that the first few times that you actually get back into it, you're just going to get dosed and it's okay. You just have to expect that. And that if you start doing something once or twice per week, that's a little bit uncomfortable, but you don't necessarily need to retest an open workout or whatever, that that will probably come back within a few weeks in terms of being able to tolerate that type of discomfort. And then Luke, I, I like the idea of, you know, if you don't have a coach, you can just really dial in your, your training log and, and try to journal how you're feeling, potentially track some biofeedback scores. Um, but if you do have a coach, it's probably valuable to, to actually speak to them about like, Hey, this is how I'm feeling. This isn't feeling good. I'm worried I've lost this. And, you know, e even if you recognize that it might be, might be just part of the process and sort of silly to be worried about it. If you let your coach know that, you know, ideally they, they would be able to, uh, to help you out with that and give you some perspective. Or if it's John, they might just, um, ignore and belittle you. What? <laughs> what? I can give you a single example of me being compassionate in the last 24 hours. Oh yeah. Name it. I mean, I'd have to think about it, but I'm sure I could. <laughs> Thanks for listening. While you're here, go ahead and head over to your podcast player, subscribe to the show, give it a rating, give it a review, all that good stuff. You can also go ahead and click through to the show notes where you can find out more about us at legionsc.com and also follow us on Instagram at legion.sc.